Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, and we're going to move into a conversation. Um, and I also want to say another thank you to everyone for your patience with us today through the screening. Um, we ran it, realized we're running a little bit behind, so we'll go a few minutes over four, but understand if folks need to head out um, at the scheduled time of ending the program. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. So I want to invite up to the stage, um, first, Antonia Grace Glenn, who is the producer and writer of this film, as well as the filmmaker behind Ito Sisters and Unwashed Masses Productions. <laughs> Um, and then I want to invite also up our guide through this film today, Professor Evelyn Nakano Glynn, who is a professor emeritus in gender and women's studies and ethnic studies at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as the producer and host of the film. And then finally, you saw him on the screen, our star of our today, Takyamashita, who um, evacuated from California to Utah and Colorado, and we're so lucky that he is here to join us today. So welcome, Tak. So we are going to get into a Q&A, so please, um, we'll have a, a mic going around in the audience in just a moment. Um, but I do want to start that something about that we talked about is that this is, um, um, or that we're thinking about is a moment of this is living history, you know, that we have here today. Um, and one of, um, I'm often reminded by our own Richard Murakami, who's here in the audience, uh, to acknowledge the folks who are here in the audience today. So first, I just want to ask if there are any other folks who were self-evacuees during the war who are here today. Oh, we have one person, a couple, two people here today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and we may ask if you would like to share anything later on in the program. Um, and then I would also like to acknowledge any of the folks who are survivors of the World War II camps who um, were incarcerated during World War II. So if you would like to stand or raise your hand, we'd love to acknowledge you here today as well. Thank you so much for being here, and we definitely want to hear your stories, and um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us today. Um, so with that, I do want to kind of go to the genesis of this film. I'm gonna, um, again, we're gonna pass a mic around, but I would love to talk, I know many of these interviews were conducted, started, this project started over 10 years ago. Um, so I'd love to just kind of talk about why, why this story, why these stories, and talk about the process of getting from those interviews to the film today. So I can go to either of you. Well, I'll, I'll ask my mother, Evelyn, to, to answer that because this was really her idea. Um, I directed the film, but I really my job was kind of taking the interviews that she conducted. Sorry, I'm too good. Um, um, the interviews that she had conducted and sort of creating an overarching narrative and you know providing the historical context and you know information about like the Keatley colony. So I, you know, the, the, my job was really kind of the, the storytelling and the overall narrative. But really, it was my mother's idea and her research, and she conducted over thirty interviews over multiple years. So I will have her answer that. Okay. Um, well, I have to uh, actually one of the sources uh, for this uh, my knowledge or my interest in the topic was actually um, my cousin Tack who told me his story, and then um, I also had a neighbor, uh, Mrs. Nagatomi, who, whose fam uh, she and her father were actually kind of diverted out of an assembly center and also self-evacuated. So those were the first two stories I heard, and then that inspired me to document this experience that I think um, most uh, Japanese Americans actually don't know about that I thought was actually important. And um, in a way, it, it um, sort of gets at the question of um, sort of uh, sharing. I think in some ways, uh, I think one of the first things that came out was that, um, what, uh, that people who did not go to the camps often ended up feeling like they were uh, sort of, in a sense, um, their stories were never told because the dominant narrative was about the camp experience. And, and this other uh, story was not told, and I think very often they felt, in some sense, um, either invisibilized or not sharing 
the same experiences as the vast majority of Japanese Americans, and yet I felt the story was very important because um, I think many people might think uh, for themselves, you know, would they have actually tried to avoid or uh, resist the internment, um, or would they have, in a sense, allowed themselves, quote, allowed themselves to be um, uh, interned, and I think for sort of later generations that sort of question comes up. Um, that I thought was very important. And now we keep hearing from people, well, we're doing screenings now that it's been on, on some PBS stations. People keep saying, that was my family's story, and it hasn't been told. And so we're just kind of getting this response of this desire for these stories to be out there. So that's why, you know, one of the reasons I really applaud my mother for wanting to pursue these untold stories, that it, 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 it expands and kind of deepens our understanding of the Japanese American wartime experience. I think my mother referenced the idea of you know, possibly a form of resistance, as opposed to what has sometimes been characterized as kind of going along with uh, the incarceration. So the, the fact that some people made different choices and in some cases ended up worse off. The idea that actually life in a camp might have possibly been preferable to being at near starvation levels with no electricity or running water. So that, you know, and, and getting to the point, as Glenn referenced, that his family actually asked to be taken into the campus and the government said no. That to me was so striking, that story. I, I think the other thing um, that's uh, in, interesting to me uh, was um, I think the self-evacuees were more likely to have thought about or to talk about the fact that uh, they didn't know what was going to happen to, them, to, to those who went to camp. That is, that they, they could be um, exterminated or um, as, as happened, of course, in, in Germany. And so I think in retrospect, the camp experience has been depicted as, in some sense, almost benign. I mean, other than the fact of being uh, incarcerated. But when you think about what people faced you know, after Pearl Harbor and the thought of what could happen to them, I think that, in fact, there, there, there was a lot more um, fear about what would happen, what would happen to you that you would be killed or in other ways uh, eliminated. And I think that part of this, that part of how people felt, I think, again, has been sort of un under examined. Um, we are, and I just want to pose a question to Tack as a follow up to that is we're talking about how um, this story isn't often told or talked about. So I would love to hear kind of what it's like to see, I don't know if you've seen this film already, or what it's like to watch this film and hear your narrative with all these others and hear these stories being told. Have you seen the, have you seen the film before? And what is it like to hear no, your story? No, I haven't seen it before. What is it like for you to see your story? Well, for me, uh, uh, I really tell a, a wonderful story. Uh, it's accurate and uh, I'm just very much impressed with the fact that it covers all the bases. Uh, you know, it was 80 years ago. And it's difficult for people to understand, I think, what it was like 80 years ago. But the story really helps. You know, most of you here probably are, are, are used to iPhones and TVs and, and all these modern devices we have. Remember, back 80 years ago, we didn't have those communication devices. Uh, although, if you notice, if, you're, if you've seen the film, you see most of the evac evacuees were, uh, self-evacuees were farmers. They were not farmers. You didn't see many of the uh, professionals covered in the film. And so, in our case, we lived in the Southern California between Coro Corona del Mar and Laguna Beach. We're kind of an isolated area. Today it's called Cor California State Park. Crystal, in fact, it's called California Crystal Cove State Park. Okay? And it's a little area between Pelican Hill and Morro Beach. There was a dozen or more Japanese American farmers that settled there started in 1927. So this is where I grew up. 
no television, no telephone, and when the war came, it was just, there was no communication. There were rumors, all types of rumors, and, and it was kind of a panicky situation. So I'm really pleased to see this film show what really happened to those of us who decided to leave because we didn't want to get evacuated. So that's today is the revelation of what, the, uh, of what had already took place. And uh, I think uh, many of us are blessed that we live through it. Uh, it the, the story is very true. Uh, in fact, it's, I think in some cases, it uh, doesn't tell some of the real horrors that we experience. But nevertheless, it covered all the bases. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, Tack Tack is 95. Just recently turned 95. <laughs> and his life story alone could be its own film because uh, you know there's so many chapters to your life story, and, and yeah, so there there are so many details that yes, we were not able to include. But but thank you for sharing your story. So, oh, yeah, I'd love to open it up to some audience questions. Um, so if anyone wants to raise their hand, we'll pass the mic around. I see we have some right here. And if we could just try to keep it uh, on the brief end, um, just so we can make sure we get to folks' questions. But <laughs> thank you. Uh, sir, my name is Hideki Obayashi. Uh, I'm 82 years old. So uh, my father came down from Seattle, uh, worked as a gardener, married my mother, who was uh, Kimia Murata. And uh, the Maratas had, uh, we were, they were farmers. Uh, first at, let's see, I can't remember, it was the Karata Ranch first, but we farmed in El Monte. Uh, I know we farmed there uh, just before the evacuation because my grandparents and my Uncle Kenji and Takeo uh, had someone watch the farm. It was about a 13 acre. Uh, farm, and I remember I, I remember part of the journey to Utah, and my mother told me that uh, uh, in some places I think it was in Nevada they refused to sell milk for me and my cousins, and they stopped at a uh, a friend's chicken ranch on the way to Utah. And I remember her telling me that it rained and water started getting inside. <clears throat> so I'm cognizant of the hardships that went through, and it was kind of neat to see in this movie uh, in more detail with the, with the restaurants and the military people guarding the bridges. I remember Utah because it was it snowed a lot, and uh, my father took us to the Great Salt Lake. Um, <clears throat> so we farmed, that's the Maratas, and then our, uh, our uh, uncles, the Kita family, the Muras, and the Okadas. So they were from Colorado. So, um, so I remember the snow, and then my father also worked at an ammunition dump or some sort of a factory. And it was there that I fell off a high chair and bit my tongue almost all the way off. Some of the other things I remember was uh, uh, I pressed on the starter of my father's international truck until the battery died and he got mad at me. I remember uh, coming back to Coming back to uh, El Monte, uh, I, I made friends with my neighbors across the street. Uh, they were a Mexican family, and I re remember getting into fights at school, uh, Petrero School in El Monte. And one thing I really remember was uh, we went to go see San Iwo Jima. And I was horrified 
and sat low in my seat when I saw the Americans fighting the Japanese. And coming out of the theater, I hung my head low because I didn't want anybody to know that I was Japanese. Uh, I had a pretty normal childhood there. Yeah. After a few years, we moved to uh, a bigger farm in Downey. Yeah. That was in 1950. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. Did you have, um, just want to make sure that we catch any question that you had with that. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, do we have any other questions in the audience? I see one down here on the first floor. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Rod Sekimoto, and uh, I grew up in Hawaii. When I uh, all, all the time living in Hawaii, I did not know about this at all, because we weren't taught about this in school. It wasn't until I uh, enrolled at San Jose State in 1961 that I found out about the relocation. And uh, my first reaction was, why would people allow themselves to be evacuated? You know, I, I, told, I thought to myself, if this was me, I would I would really rebel against this, you know. Then I found out about the no-no boys, and so I, I thought, well, at least there's somebody that, you know, confronted this. Um, now, learning about the, the people that voluntarily evacuated, that opened up my eyes, you know. And I think that uh, the Glens, you have opened up a part of history that that uh, was never known for a lot of people. So I think what you did is very good, and I hope that it would, that it will be taught in the schools because that's really completes the picture. I think. So Thank you. I really enjoyed this, and uh, and you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There's one right up here. Um. So it was mentioned that this is, was broadcast on PBS. Was it American Experience series or? It was not, but if you want to contact them, <laughs> I recommend it. Um, it premiered on KVIE, which is a Sacramento PBS station, okay. and we're working with a, a distributor called Nita to try to get it on additional stations, so hopefully on PBS SoCal and K right, exactly. QED, and yeah, so, so we're, we're, hoping, we're hoping that for May, for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, that oh, then we'll see it on some more stations. And it always helps when people do reach out to their local stations. And so my and parents share. were newly married, my mother was 18, and they were they self evacuated to Alt, Colorado, which is just below the Wyoming border. And we didn't hear very much, except I would grill my parents about their experience. And then two years ago, when we drove our son back across the country to New Jersey, we went and visited the people in Alt. And it was the public librarian. I'm a librarian, but the public librarian that I I called the Alt Public Library, and he was a great source of information to me. So if you ever need like history stuff, call the local pu uh, public library. But I want to thank you. This is the power of a family, a mother, a daughter, and an uncle. Beautiful, beautiful family. stream the film on the PBS website. So if you go if you just Google PBS before they take us away, you can watch. It's an hour version. This is the full length director's cut is almost 80, but the broadcast version is an hour, but it has you know most of the same stories. Maybe we should uh, do a little whatever selling here and ask people to uh, contact their local PBS station. I have a comment. Um, over the past few years, the general uh, scholar, uh, professor at USC, Dr. Duncan Williams, 
put together this book called EEA book right now over at the uh, Japanese American National Museum. And I always have thought that there needs to be something done to acknowledge all the families that were self, you know, uh, left the, uh, the West Coast because all their names are not in one place like the EA book. So I'm planting a seed in your minds <laughs> to get something like that accomplished so that these people can have a place to pay respects to their ancestors. That's an excellent point. And we're actually, we're screening at USC in two weeks and we'll see Duncan there. So we'll, we'll mention that idea to him because I think that's an excellent point. And they also have the, the flags that people have been signing. Yeah, the, the, the Johnny Gogo flags. Yeah, the Johnny Gogo flags, which I think, oh, that, that I think, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's all the full Japanese American experience. So I think that's also really, I think that's a real, an important memorial project. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions down here. Um, so we'll run the mic down. But I did want to ask, I feel like a couple of people have mentioned this as like an educational opportunity. Do you have any, or like how has that reception been? Have you been able to screen it with any like students or be in conversation? I know that you spent many years teaching. <laughs> not, not yet. We, we're going to be at um, Virginia Tech in the fall. We're at USC. We're talking to uh, UC Berkeley. Um, like I, I think it would be good also at the high school and middle school level. So um, we we don't necessarily have any formal plans, but yes, I would I would very much like to to have that uh, outlet as well. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, another question? Yes. Hi, uh, Vicky Yamashita. No relation actually, but um, first of all, thanks for documenting this because evermore. I mean, whoever thought we would see where we are now with things like this, like, you know, what your, your film show in Florida? You know, hmm, I don't know. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my question was kind of a pragmatic one with having to do with social media. Do you have an Instagram page or anything so that should there be these connections, I mean, you know, there's certain generations where that is the mode of communication and amplifying to be able to tag and, and um, reach out to PBS and try to amplify this. Um, I was just curious if there is that. We do. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm not good at social media, but we do have we have a website and we do have links on the web. So it's before they take us away .com. and then our, our social media is linked on there. And we're trying to kind of expand a little bit more to, to use those platforms. So yeah, thank you. A couple of postscripts. I'm curious if you talked about the reparations that are eventually provided by the U.S. government for the people that were detained. Any comments about that? Um, actually, the selfie documentaries were also uh, included in the reparations. Oh, yeah. Just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the the selfie documentaries were also included as part of the reparations. And what were the reparations? Well, it was basically a token payment, I guess, of twenty thousand. Yeah, twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. How many years? But you have to be living. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know. How many years did it take the U.S. government to recognize that? Uh, the Civil Liberties Act, I believe, was in 88. But, yeah, who, who would like to talk more about yeah, that? Yeah, in fact, uh, yes. Um, uh, at that time, I was living in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, uh, my husband actually was the uh, head of the, he, he's a Hakujin, but he, he was, he's the president of the, uh, you know, New England J JCL, and uh, we actually managed to get a hearing of the, uh, I forget the name of the committee that, you know, there were hearings uh, that were around the country, mostly, of course, um, in areas where Japanese Americans were concentrated. But um, what we offered was the possibility of um, having a legal analysis. So it was held at the uh, Harvard Law School. And um, in fact, we had uh, some people from New England testify at that hearing. and. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think that that redress was very important in terms of mobilizing the Japanese American community, aside from whatever the apology and the token um, payment. I think it was a very important vehicle for, uh, for Japanese American, um, um, I guess, self-organizing, self which also then made possible uh, organizing uh, against uh, other 
movements, other things such as uh, uh, immigrant detention and all that sort of thing. So I think the, the movement uh, had very positive impacts aside from getting apology. I have one more uh, comment. Uh, you had mentioned Andy, uh, Tak Yamashita himself has had a very distinguished career. Many people may not know that he ended up working for Werner von Braun. Um, he was in the military in Alabama. There's quite a story there. We were kind of joking that somebody should make a movie about him. Because <laughs> he was really at the beginning of Fortran and Cobalt language on the computer. Many people don't know that. They were all many of the programs. Well, I thought that's because they were talking about your long and distinguished career. <laughs> <laughs> and how you should be, there should be just a movie I'm about. Sorry. What did you say? We're talking about your long and distinguished career and the fact that there should be a movie about you because your life story was very interesting. And all, of the, all that you accomplished while also repeatedly facing. So what do you want? What do you want? <laughs> what do you want me to say? Do you want to say anything about? Do you want to say anything about sort of your your My career kind of career path after? Yeah, and sort of what you. Well, is this microphone? It's all, it's all. <laughs> you can talk. You can talk right into it. Oh. Well, let's just say I was blessed. Uh, you know, I grew up in a farm. Uh, we were in kind of poverty area, and uh, we really didn't have the opportunity. I was at the time, and I grew up in Colorado. I was 16 years old. I think I graduated from high school there, and. I really didn't, my family really didn't promote being educated. They were so busy trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. But they allowed me to go to college and I was blessed to do that. Uh, fortunately, I, I did finish my college education, but then I got drafted in the Army and I spent six years in service and I was trained to be uh, an infantry soldier. But somehow, the Army died, decided that uh, I would stay in the States. And I landed in Alabama, and uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Von Braun, the, a British, a brilliant rocket scientist from Germany, was working for us. And he, he and his 125 uh, German rocket scientists were transferred into Huntsville, Alabama from uh, Fort Bliss, Texas at the time. And for reasons unknown to me, he selected me out of a group of military officers and asked me to help him. And that's where I started my career. Uh, in fact, uh, he's been a lifelong friend of mine. And if it wasn't for he and a, and a fellow scientist named Dr. Hamlet Holzer, I don't think I would have had a career. But my work with them for a good many years until I got out of the Army really propelled me into industry and uh, helped me become successful from a you know, <coughs> poor farm boy to uh, be uh, working in a large Fortune 500 cor corporations. Uh, I don't know how much I can say about it, but I can, you know, there's so much detail about it. But let me place, I, I feel very, very happy that I was part of the, uh, part of a group of scientists that helped us reach, put a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> Any other different uh, uh, careers in my life, I was uh, eventually ended up working, uh, developing uh, a, today what we call a GPS system, but for our atomic submarines. So we can, you know, I don't know if any of you know, but uh, the conventional submarines, they had the surface and have a navigation 
navigate or shoot the star to see where they're at. And uh, so the submarine had to surface every so often. But the modern submarine today can travel underneath the water without ever surfacing. That's because we have a, a modern technology with a basic, uh, a GPS system, basically a GPS system for the ground work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. Professor Glenn had a follow-up question for you about one of your points. I think for Professor Glenn had later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't interrupt. <laughs> And I ended my career in the aerospace industry and my last project I was uh, part of a team that built the, that built the uh, B-2 stealth bomber. Wow. And, and when the, that bomber did a first flight it was accepted, uh, that was time for me to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been retired for uh, 27 yeah, years. Thank you. I want to tell you folks and talk about career. I'm very blessed because I have a wonderful wife and a wonderful family and my children. Is, I'm so proud of them and my grandchildren. They've all exceeded my expectation. They, uh, my children have uh, reached their potential or even exceeded their potential. I think I, they're here too, right? So, uh, <laughs> Does your family want to wave hello to the crowd? Yeah. <laughs> um, I hate to cut us off, but I think we're almost at time. So I just wanted to ask the filmmakers if you had any final comments. Sorry. I want to oh. say everything I've done in career means nothing. Really nothing. Because, you know, life is short. <laughs> I'm 95 years old and I'm happy and I'm blessed. And I thank all of you here for being here. And please thank these folks here. For so much fun. I just want to thank Joy. I want to thank Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone at Janum. It's, it's a delight to be here. It's so meaningful for us to, to come back here again and to be able to share the story. And there's a lot of members of the creative team for the film who are here. So my brother Patrick who's one of the producers and did camera work, including a fantastic drone footage. Um, Dave Iwataki, the composer of the music, is back there, so I just wanted to see. And I think Joel, Joel Iwataki, that right here, who did the music mix scene. Uh, where's Grace? Grace Wilkham, who's one of our voice actors, I noticed here. Grace, where are you? I can't see. Um, are there any other members of the creative team? I just want to make sure to recognize people who worked on the film, because it was a lot. A lot of people, so. so so thank you, and thank you so much to the wonderful audience. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for joining us here today. Um, the museum's open for about another 30 minutes, but we hope that you either uh, visit today or come back another day to explore lots of the stories from today intertwined with the stories that we tell here at Janum. Um, we're so thankful for you all, and please get home safe, and please join me in another round of applause for our filmmakers. <laughs>